so on this laptop, right? Okay. So I'm going to be talking about identifying the sex of caterpillars, the white marked tussock moth. So some background on this, the white marked tussock moth is a forest pest moth, and they have wings that typically develop during the larval stages, but the females, when they develop the wings, are absorbed during the pupal stages. So the wings, or the genes for wing loss, has to be expressed in females, but not in males, and this expression could occur during like the caterpillar stage or the pupal stage. And it's also impossible to tell by just observation if they are male or female, so we have to find out like a molecular way to figure this out. So we do know that females have a ZW chromosome and males have a ZZ chromosome. So we're trying to find the gene that's attached to the W chromosome in the females. You can also see here on this slide, the males are gonna be up on the left and the females are up on the right, so you can see the wing development of them too. So then what we have to do in order to figure this out is PCR. So we're going to be making multiple copies of DNA in order to look at it and examine it. And some history about this was that Carrie B. Mullis invented it in 1983. And at first, the E. coli enzyme was used in every step of the reaction, but since it couldn't uh, withstand the rapid, in heating, like, rapid heating and cooling process, it had to be replaced every single time. And then also, they also used three water baths instead of just like having the temperatures change all at once because they couldn't do that, so they had to manually switch it after a certain amount of time to go through. So then, thanks to technology, we found TAC polymerase, which was discovered from the Thermus aquaticus, and this could withstand the rapid heating and cooling process, so we didn't have to switch it out after every single reaction. And then we also were able to invent a thermocycler so that manually switched the temperatures for us so we didn't have to do the water bath thing. And then some important terms too for this would be a DNA, and that is what carries the genetic information in our bodies and other living things. And it has a double helix structure, so it's two-stranded. And then we have primers, which initiate the reaction, and then we made up about like 20 base pairs, so it kind of gets it started when we're making a copy. And then we have nucleotides, which are the structural unit of DNA. So there's A, T, C, and G are the number of letters that we use. And then we have TAC polymerase, which attaches the nucleotides <coughs> to the DNA copy once we get that. So PCR uh, stands for polymerase chain reaction. And that just makes multiple copies of DNA over and over and over again. So through PCR, there's three stages. So first, the DNA denatures. So with heating, that'll pull the double strand apart to two single strands. And then it anneals it, so that kind of helps attach the primers in there to get it started for elongation, which is where it connects the rest of the nucleotides to continue on through. So then PCR works by to amplify a segment of DNA. Um, it's heated, so the DNA denatures, so it separates like you can see in the picture. And then the TAC polymerase helps attach the primers to the separate strands of DNA, so that way elongation can be started, as you can also see in the picture here. So you can get as many DNA copies as you want. So then what I do personally to help out with this is just PCR by itself. So first I will fill out this sheet, and it's kind of like a recipe for a master mix is what we call it. And instead of doing individual measurements into each sample tube, we do one big mix and then pipette that into a tube. So we have a buffer, DNTP, it's two primers that we do name there too, and then the tag polymerase. So we do the individual amounts first, and then we multiply it by the number of reactions plus one. So like down here, we have the names of the samples we're using, and we take those four, we add a negative control, and then we add another one. So you get a number of six, for example. So we multiply the individual amounts by six to get a total, and that's how we make our master mix. And then down by the sample names, we put how much of the master mix we're putting in there, and then next to it, how much of the DNA we're gonna be putting in there. So then once we get the sheets filled out, we actually have to gather the tubes. And since we are constantly shedding DNA everywhere, and there's all sorts of DNA in the bio lab, <laughs> we have to be very careful not to cross-contaminate things. So when we get the tubes, we have to kind of shake them out of the tub into the lid and then grab them from there. And then once we do that, we have to label them all so we know <coughs> which is which and we don't get anything mixed up. 
And then from there, we have to transfer everything into the fume hood. Again, to avoid contamination, we don't want to mix anything. So this fume hood is separate from everything else, just to be safe. And all the measurements are done in there. And then once that is completed, we take all the measurements out, and we tra or not the measurements, but the samples, and we transfer those out, we vortex it to make sure that they're properly mixed. And then we're going to place them in the thermocycler, which is the denaturation, annealing, and elongation. So then, to make sure that it's successful, we're going to use a gel electrophoresis to make sure that what we want it to happen is happening. So the samples are loaded into 1% Aragos gel, which separates the DNA based on fragment size. So DNA is negatively charged and is attracted to the positive electrode. So the smaller fragments are going to travel a lot faster than the longer ones. And successful PCR products are checked for size against a standard ladder of about 100 base pair pieces. So you can see in the picture, it starts at about 100 base pairs and can go up to 1,200 base pairs. And what we're personally looking for is 400. And we want them to be like nice, clear, and bright bars as well when we're looking at these. So basically what we're doing is testing the effectiveness of DNA extraction techniques by using an easy to amplify gene region and the DNA extractions are of high quality. So our next steps with this is that we're gonna verify the W chromosome genes by using a model organism, the Bombix mori, and we're gonna extract the DNA from that and use PCR with published primers, and then we're gonna test the successful primers <clears throat> with the white mark tussock moth to see if that works the same way. So yeah, and then just thank you to the McNair program and the US Masters program for helping me out with this and to Darian for letting me help him on his research, and Dr. Becky Simmons for being my mentor and being great. <laughs> and that is it. <laughs>